Week number two in our shortened, concise, astute, hopefully, version of Spiritual Rants this year. And you can still get the long, drawn-out version. (laughs) Most of them were, I guess, around an hour or even longer last year. But I'm reposting them. So as you're reading through the Bible, that's the goal. This is Spiritual Rants and Jerry Rothhauser, by the way. And I've been trying to guide you reading through the Bible in its entirety in the year. Following basically the one-year Bible pericopes. A pericope is a passage, passages from the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs. So, if you follow the readings in the one-year Bible, you can find numerous ways to read through the Bible in a year, and several of them that I've found still break it into Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs. But, you know, you just want to read the New Testament, you can do that, or just the Old Testament. Or just Psalms and Proverbs. But anyway, I'm trying to help you as you read through the Bible because as you're reading through, it's like, what? What's that mean? Or do I really need to read all of these genealogies? Answer, no. Although in the midst of some of those genealogies, there's like uh, an important statement. So I alert you to that. So anyway... This is week two, and if you're following that reading plan, you'd be in Genesis 18 through 31, Matthew 6 toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, verse 25 through 1025, Psalm 8 through 12, and Proverbs chapter 2, 6 through chapter 3, 15. So there you go. Now, something I've been pointing out to you, and I I think you're going to enjoy this, and I I try to keep it to around 15 minutes. I was unsuccessful last week, although friends of mine were still in awe that I kept it at 16 minutes. (laughs) But that's the goal, 15 minutes, just once a week to try to help you with something devotional, or point out what's sensational in the scripture, or theologically very important, things like that. That's what I try to point out to you in that longer version. Now I'm just focusing on one thing. One thing. And now that you've read through chapter 12, because you did that in the first week, The first week, you got to Genesis 12, and within those readings, you covered, if you can believe this or not, 2,000 years. Now, some people would say longer, and some would say much, much, much longer than that, but I'll, I'll, uh, in full disclosure, I believe in a young earth, so... From creation all the way to Abraham in chapter 12, I think probably somewhere around 2,000. Some people think 4,000. They still believe in a young earth. Or, of course, people who don't believe in creation think it's million, millions, and billions of, how do they say, billions and billions, whatever. So, but there are good Christians that think maybe 4,000 years or even more. But I hold to probably around 2,000 there. And then Abraham came on the scene somewhere around 2,100. So like 2,000 years basically rounding down to 2,000. Abraham until Jesus about 2,000. So the beginning of things you read in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And now, of course, we've gotten to beyond past the year 2000. So about, in my mind, 6,000 years 
that people have been around and things have been around, the earth has been around. But other people see it differently. But nevertheless, I think this is the theme of the Bible. So if you've listened to my podcast in the past, last year, and did I mention I'm reposting them, and reposting actually all the blogs. And so those are concise commentaries on Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs as you're reading through, and you'll find that at spiritualrants.com or jerryrothhauser.com. Gets you at the same place, but then you have to be able to spell Rothhauser. Anyway, so written blogs, commentaries, and then the audio podcast last year, and abbreviated main point stuff this year. Now, I got off uh, track. (laughs) If you have been listening before, here's what you know is what I think is the theme of the Bible. Now, I heard a famous Bible commentator on the radio one time, and he said the purpose of the Bible is to keep you out of hell. Boy, that's pessimistic, and it is true, but I'd rather turn it upside down and look at it positively and say that the purpose of the Bible that God gave us, that inspired scripture from Genesis to Revelation, was to have a relationship with humankind. So rebellion against God leads to death, and a relationship with God leads to life. And I tend to look at it more positively that God wants to have a relation, a a personal relationship with us, and that's why he gave us the Bible. Now, years ago, not that many years ago, but years years ago, probably in our perspective in our human lives, we're going back to around 1900, maybe 1911. I don't have the exact date, but that's approximate. That was when the first study Bible first appeared. I just was redundant, wasn't I? It first first appeared. It was called the Schofield Bible. It helped a lot of people to understand the Bible. And of course, that was a little over 100 years ago. Why did it help people so much? This former lawyer, gone theologian, he was helping people to see that there are things called dispensations in the Bible. And I'm, I'm getting to a major point, even though I'm explaining some information and history to you. Dispensation is a word used in the King James. Well, that made sense because most people, if not everyone, who read the Bible read the King James. A lot of people read the King James now, and maybe even more people read the New King James. It's, it, it came out in the 1600s, the King James. Then it was revised in the 1800s. And even with that, with that revision in the 1800s, we still have some antiquated language in there, although... It's very poetic, and if you can understand the antiquated words, it's very accurate. But at any rate, now a lot of people read the New International Version, the New American Standard Bible, which is what I use in my blogs and use it on the podcast usually. But lots of people have read the King James, and since... I was saved in the 70s. A lot of new translations have come out. Holcomb, the Holman Christian Standard has come out since then. The Living Bible, the New Living Translation, there's been 
a veritable provision of translations, lots of them. Anyway, the great granddaddy of all of those study Bibles that now come out, and there's been a, not only a profusion of translations, but study Bibles. So you have NIV study Bible, you have the Quest, you have an apologetics, you have an application Bible, all kinds of, Ryrie is a, is a good one for theology. Anyway, all of those coming out, but the first was the Schofield Bible. Why did that help people so much? It was because he pointed out these errors in time were in God related to mankind in different ways. And uh, obviously in different eras at different times. Now, four of those out of the seven that he enumerated occurred by chapter 12 of Genesis. So within those, but it is 2,000 years. So the first one, and, you know, here where I'm headed is relating to God and how to relate to God now. The first one he termed innocence because Adam and Eve in the garden was, they were innocent. That makes sense, right? And then there was a change, obviously, after the fall. And after the fall, God related to mankind differently, right? Wouldn't you agree with that? He called the second one conscience or moral responsibility. So in other words, Adam and Eve were not face-to-face with God, but they were outside the garden, and they were on their own following the dictates of their conscience. Another biggie in Genesis 8.15, he called it human government. A good example of that would be Babel. Because at the Tower of Babel, humankind rebelled in having that tower. A lot of people think it was for astrology, but whatever it was, God didn't like it. And so he separated all kinds of people on the basis of their language, because their human government was corrupt. The fourth out of the four in the first 2,000 years he called promise in Genesis 12, 1, because Abraham received an important promise from God. And on that promise, he related to God. And we see the story of Abraham as you're reading it this week and last week. And that develops into the the Jews and Israel. And so we read about Israel throughout the rest of the Old Testament. With Moses, Schofield called that a new era in Exodus 19.1 the law. And you could see why that would be the case, right? So God is looking to interact with human beings and have relationships with them. We're currently in the church age, according to Acts 2, 1 in Schofield, and then the kingdom, the 1,000-year millennial period that I talk to talk about often in Revelation 20, verse 4. So Galatians 3, 24, if you want to check this out, tells us, how the Old Testament helps us, especially the law. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 11, I always like the King James says in samples. It's examples. See, that's why they update it. And the Old Testament gives us an, an example and examples in, of people and in the law and all kinds of things, the poetry, the history, that help us understand our relationship with God in the New Testament. Well, since Abraham was in the time of promise, 
I was going to get into four promises that you can trust God for in this new year, but I'm running out of time. So, I'm going to tell you what they are, and you can look them up. Isaiah 41.10 says that God is with us and can strengthen us. 1 Peter 5.7 helps with anxiety. James 1.5, if you need wisdom in anything you do where you're trying to serve God, there is a, a univocal, I call it, promise from God, in other words, there's no nothing tricky, there's uh, no catches. James 1.5, God will give you wisdom. And Philippians 4.13, strength. All right, well, there we go. It's about 16 minutes again. Jerry Rothhauser here with Spiritual Rants. I hope you'll continue to be downloading next week.